Uh, good afternoon. Um, we are resuming our afternoon the session with additional interviews of candidates for the Phoenix City Court position. Uh, our first interviewee this afternoon is, is Kathy Lemke. I would remind those of you who are present and, uh, and watching not to disclose the interview questions to any of the candidates who have yet to be interviewed. Good afternoon, Ms. Lemke. Good afternoon. You've got some water there in front of you. Thank you. Hopefully it's unopened. <laughs> it appears to be. Uh, we, have, we have about half a dozen questions for you this afternoon, and we expect that the interview will last on the order of 15 minutes or so. Very well. So, uh, Ms. Adele? Hi, Kathy. Congratulations on making it to this stage of the process. Thank you very much. So our first question for you, um, we'd like for you to tell us about a time that you faced an ethical dilemma. It can be personal, it can be professional, but also tell us about how that experience changed you as a person. I think I have to talk about something that recently happened within the last couple of years. Um, I've had an opportunity to go over to the U.S. Attorney's Office and work with them there and deal with some substantial national firearm cases. And in particular, an issue came up where um, an officer wrote down information in a report that was not consistent with either my memory of the events when I sat through the interview, nor the memory of my co-counsel on the case. And I had to directly confront that officer about the statements that were made and make sure that the statements were corrected and disclose both the original statements that the officer wrote and then the subsequent um, report that was created from that one. It was significant for me because um, I had worked on that investigation for a substantial period of time, had invested a lot of resources of the office, and were nearly at the finish line in it, the prosecution of the case, and didn't want to have that type of tumble that would prevent the prosecution from being successfully obtained in that matter. So as painful as it was to have to disclose that information, I knew it was the right thing to do because whenever you tell the truth, you don't have to worry about anything else. Um, that's the most important thing is that you're being honest and uh, truthful when you're handling the matter so that judges, opposing counsel, can have an opportunity to decide on the merits. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I have a factual scenario to give you. Um, I would just like you to listen to the factual scenario um, and then kind of tell me how you would handle that and if you see any issues that you think need to be addressed or just want to be pointed out, just let me know, okay? Um, the factual scenario is that uh, assume that you are a City of Phoenix judge. You are down at their jail court or IA court. And as a part of that, it's the middle of the night doing that procedures and you have someone come in that uh, is a charge of a, with a criminal offense. It is a domestic violence offense, so there's a victim. And as you go through talking with that uh, person through that procedure, you kind of have some concerns about their competency to proceed. Um, nonetheless, the individual who's in front of you is adamant that they want to plead right up to the court right there, which sometimes happens down in that court, and they want to resolve the case both for themselves, their family, and the victim. Uh, they want to get that over with. Um, how would you handle that situation and what do you perceive the issues to be? I'm presuming from this scenario that the prosecution is not present. Right. So um, if I have concerns about the competency of the individual and also that the prosecution is not present, I'm going to take a couple courses of actions. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that um, the prosecution weighs in on whether or not this matter should sh proceed in the course of the courtroom. Um, as we all know, domestic violence crimes do not require a victim's buy-in on that type of prosecution. A matter can go forward without the victim wanting the matter prosecuted. Uh, there's a lot of policy reasons behind that that show that that should go forward. So I'm not going to um, have the matter dismissed or uh, conclude the, the charges at that time. Additionally, I'm going to also make sure that there is court appointed a counsel on that matter. Now it's my understanding from both the times that I practice over at the city of Phoenix and my understanding still today that on domestic violence cases, because there is the potential of jail time, that that person will be appointed counsel. And so I wanna make sure that defense counsel does do an inquiry about whether or not that defendant is competent to stand trial. 
And so I would direct that uh, defense counsel, if they're not going to be the assigned defense counsel that continues through the matter, to make sure that it is noted and that they do that type of preliminary inquiry. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ms. Lemke, uh, as you said, you had the chance to practice for several years in the municipal court. Um, do you think that uh, the court has a role to play in the broader community? Uh, and if so, what do you think their role is? And then, it's a multi-part question, um, what, uh, what do you think the role of individual judges is in the broader community? I absolutely think that the City of Phoenix Court has a vital role in the community. This is where the meat and potato cases are heard. These are not the cases that involve billion dollar transactions. These are the cases where the average, average citizen is pulled in, whether it's because they're a witness in a vehicle accident, whether they themselves are being cited for some traffic violation, whether it's because the next door neighbor has a dog that's barking and it's bothering the neighborhood. All of these things impact the community. All of, these mat all of these cases matter to the community because we have a standard of what we want our neighbors to behave like with one another. I think that the role of the judge is to be both a role model in the courtroom, be fair, be impartial, listen to the parties, let them have their opportunity, have their matter heard in court. I also think it's a, an important part for the judge to have a role just being an, an active participant in the community. It doesn't necessarily mean that the person has to be on a committee, doesn't mean that they have to volunteer at a food shelter, but to be a person who lives, works, shops, goes out to dinner, um, entertains in the community. And it can also be a role model on that day-to-day -day basis because we are being judged when we're not on our job, when we are out in the community. So I think it's important that you continue to be that role model as you just go about your day-to-day -day life. Next question is, uh, Phoenix has a very diverse population. What strategies would you use as a judge to ensure that every individual that appears before you feels that they've been treated fairly? Well, I think some very simple, common skills that we all learned in kindergarten apply. Greeting a person by name, talking to them by name, looking in them in the eye when they're talking to you, paying attention to them. I know often when you're trying to move a docket along and trying to be efficient, you're marking down paperwork so that you can proceed on to the next matter. But it really makes a difference to people if you can just stop for a moment, look them in the eye, talk to them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I think also that there has been a lot of um, outreach that goes on about understanding other communities and other cultures. Um, so I think those type of things, the awareness for for example, implicit bias. I know that there's been additional training that the City of Phoenix has <coughs> undergone. I'm not sure about the judges, but I would be surprised if they have not undergone the implicit bias training. So I think those are the types of things that need to be continued to develop and reinforced across the years. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Uh, what element in your background and experience do you feel will be the most significant to becoming a good judge? I can't point to just one example, and I know that that's not satisfying, but I think it has to go through my entire life. Um, from the time I was a little kid, my parents made sure that I worked hard, I was honest, I was fair, I didn't lie. So when it was I broke the little piece of artwork that was sitting on the coffee table when I was five years old and I was worried about getting punished for that, I knew I needed to tell them that I broke it. And my dad was so happy that I told him that I broke it rather than him finding the, the shards on the ground that he gave me a Coca-Cola. So, you know, it was reinforced in me at a very young age. Do the right thing. It doesn't matter if something bad happened. You can always recuperate from that. So that just continued on where my father made sure that we all worked. He built homes, so he had six kids who could come on over to those homes that he was building and clean out the sites, pick up the copper wire so that we could salvage the copper wire, brush it out so that when the carpenters came in, they, they had 
a, a clean work area, make sure that the plumbers were getting there on time, picking up rocks. Whatever it was, we were his day laborers for the, that period of time. And the day I turned 16 years old, um, before I got my birthday cake, he took me to the McDonald's to fill out the application to get a job. So hard work has always been something that has continued through. And that's the same thing as, as I've had this profession in law, that I've worked hard, I've always gone from one job to the next without breaks in between, because I know that the work I do is important. And I've been really fortunate to work in a lot of great places with some great people who've helped guide me to make sure that I follow the principles that all good judges do, be fair, be impartial. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What level of importance would you place on fairness and equity as a judge, and how would you measure your success in being fair and equitable? I think fair and equitable, if I can just also add the word impartial, I think those um, have the fountainheads for all of judicial temperament, skills, and things that we're looking for in judges. We want them to listen to what people have to say. We want them not to prejudge matters. We want them to be open-minded. We want them to follow the rule of law, follow the evidence and apply it to make sure that the outcome, whether or not somebody gets what they want, but that what we have set down as a community standard is reach. So I think fairness, equitableness, and impartiality those are the things that I think are the most important for a judge to always remember that everything that they do stems from those three things. Okay, and the second part was the, how would you measure your success in being fair, equitable, and impartial? Thank you for making sure that I answered your entire question. I appreciate that opportunity. Um, I think that my job that I've had in the various locations that I've worked has shown that I listen to the evidence that's presented to me. I review that evidence. I don't make up my mind until I have all of that evidence. I welcome opposing counsel to provide me additional information for my consideration. And I believe that they're well aware of that fact. It's not my goal to go out and prosecute somebody who is not guilty of the crime. It's also not my goal to make sure that somebody has the most sentence that could possibly be imposed under the rules of law. It's to make sure that that person who has um, received a punishment is going to change and conform to what we want as a society, which is we want them to be law-abiding. We want them to be productive members, and we want to make sure that they don't go and commit that offense again. You know, uh, uh, Ms. Lemke, you, you've, you've, been, you've been a valued, valued prosecutor for, uh, for all of your career, either in city, uh, county, or federal courts. Uh, reflect on, reflecting on, on your career as a, as a prosecutor and the experiences you've had in that role, uh, what can you, what experience or accomplishment would you offer in support of uh, to someone who would say, well, we're not so sure about appointing someone who's only been on one side of the table? Again, there's not just one particular thing. I'll just come up with and explain to you perhaps one that has um, many examples of where I wasn't just as a prosecutor, but I was an, an, an advocate for justice. And I think that has to do with one of the, the cases I mentioned in my application packet, which was United States versus George Clark and, et al. This involved six individuals who were defrauding the government in the firearm cases. And they were making machine guns when they shouldn't have been. Each one of those individual defendants had a different role in that matter. Each one of them did different acts. And no one of them had any more innocence than the other. But they all had different amounts of participation in the conspiracy. So it would have been really easy to just go and say, you violated the law. The law says that you can get 10 years for this. That's what's going to happen. 
but each one of those individual defendants had, like I said, a different role and it needed different evaluation of both what charges to bring against them, what to seek as far as a resolution of the matter, how to present the information to the court for the court to decide what in the range of possible sentences is the appropriate one, to advocate on behalf of the government, but also to make sure that the court was aware of those defendants' participation both in the crimes and what they did afterwards to accept their responsibility. Thank you. In conclusion, you know, as you know, we are we are have the pleasure of interviewing a number of highly qualified candidates today, including yourself. What would you like to leave us with uh, uh, in terms of what you think would set you apart from the other candidates? Well, certainly my years of experience are something that this body should consider. I've had a wide breadth of experience both in justice courts, superior courts, the other state courts in other counties, in federal court, but most importantly here in the city of Phoenix. So I've had a, a global view on the, the justice system here in the District of Arizona, the state of Arizona. And because of that, I'm able to bring those experiences in and remind um, the parties of the level of practice that we expect, the professionalism that's required, the application of the law and the evidence to make sure that parties are responsible, to make sure that the sentences are just and fit the crime. Those are the things that certainly this body has in front of it to consider. But most importantly, because of that experience that I've had in all of those jurisdictions, I'm able to hit the ground running here in the city of Phoenix. I practiced here, I've handled large dockets here, I've helped other colleagues in processing their paperwork to be more efficient on that matter. I have the ability to um, both provide the time and attention to the matter, but move matters along as well. Those are things that are certainly are important in the city of Phoenix, but I'm also committed to making advancements and improvements here in the city of Phoenix. I think technology is here to stay. There's nothing we can do about that. And I think we need to look at ways that we can start processing our courtrooms using more than just pen and paper, but to be able to digitally process that, including giving information out to the witnesses and the defendants on the matter so that they can come in and timely appear. Those are the type of things that I believe that I can bring here to the city of Phoenix, but it's because I have the passion to live here, to work here for the past 20 years, that this is the place I wanna work. I've only applied to the city of Phoenix as the judge for the city of Phoenix. I'm not applying anywhere else. I wanna serve my community. I wanna work here in this community, providing justice to everyone here. I thank you very much for your time and I appreciate you considering me for this position. Thank you very much for your time and for uh, your answers. We've enjoyed getting to know you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Our next interview will be with Thomas Scarduzio.
right up in front here. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. You've got some water there if you'd like it. All right, thank you. We have about a half a dozen questions for you, and uh, we expect the interview will last in the order of 15 minutes or so. So, Fine. very good. Ms. Dell? By the way, I, I, sometimes I don't hear everything, okay? If you, if you, I, I live with someone like that, so just ask <laughs> if you don't hear. I feel for you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Congratulations on making it to this part in the process. Thank you. Uh, the first question that we have for you is we'd like for you to tell us about a time when you faced an ethical dilemma. It could be personal or professional. And tell us how dealing with that ethical dilemma changed you as a person. Maybe that's a little hard for me because I've always taken the ethical rules very strictly. And so, if I see anything that bothers me, I'll talk to somebody, I'll do something, you know, but I won't necessarily move on. Um, ethical dilemmas. I mean, I've been doing this pro teming since 2003, and the only ethical dilemmas I seem to remember is when I was practicing law, not when I was doing this. I mean, and I know that's a terrible answer, but the... Uh, <laughs> The fact of the matter is, is that that's our rules, that's what we do. If you run into a question, you should not well go forward until you are resolved that there's not a problem, that's all. You just stop and you don't go forward, that's all. Best I can do with that one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Mrs. Carduzio. Um, I have a factual scenario to give you. Okay. Um, if you could just listen to the factual scenario and then kind of tell me how you would handle that and if you see any issues that you think that would need to be addressed by you or any issues generally for that factual scenario, if you could just point them out to us and let us know how you would proceed. Okay. So assume you are a City of Phoenix judge. You're down I'm in a, the aisle. I've been a pro tem yeah. judge. Okay. So you are down in the aisle in your jail court. You have someone come into the jail court. Um, they are charged with a criminal offense. That individual, it's a victim crime. It's a domestic violence offense. Um, and that individual comes back and you're talking with that individual about the charges and you kind of get the feeling that he may have some competency issues. Nonetheless, he wants to plead up right there. He wants to get it over with. He wants to roll it and both for himself and his family. And he's adamant that he really wants to resolve the case right there. Um, how would you proceed or what do you think the issues are in that factual scenario? Well, the first thing is if I ever see a competency issue, we're fortunate that we have the people from the mental health department who are there. So well, the first thing I do is I call them in and I say, is he one of yours? Is he, is he you know, receiving services? Is he, you know, because we have what is called SMI, seriously mentally ill, and GMI, which is general mental health. And the SMI people are treated by the behavior people. The general mental health, quite frankly, we don't do enough from them, but so if I have an issue with it, I will let them tell me, first of all, if they're covered. If they're not covered, then I make a decision. Um, I'm not going to take a plea from somebody that I'm not particularly uh, assured or that I don't feel comfortable that they know what they're doing or that it would be in their best interest. So I've done that before. I've, and I've done it with people that didn't have a mental health issue. If I had a problem with them taking a plea, I'll just tell them we're not taking a plea today. I'll appoint you an attorney, let the attorney talk to you. Um, then we'd argue over whether the person should be released, but that's a different issue completely. Uh, but if I feel there's anything not right, and I've been, I, when I was a PD, I had a contract for a number of years, and I used to be able to talk to people like with three sentences and know there was something wrong, that it wasn't quite right. And I still have that. I don't know where I got it from, I can't tell you, but I can tell talking to people that Maybe it's not right. Maybe we shouldn't do it. So anytime I feel like that, I don't, I don't take pleas just to take pleas. I don't. I try to get <clears throat> the person with someone that can help them. And if, you know, the other thing in jail court you got to remember is they could be doing all of this stuff, and they could be like high as a kite on some kind of drug or alcohol or something like that. So you don't really know if it's mental illness. So you're always better off 
erring on the side of caution, that's so you don't hurt anybody. I mean, that's just the way it is. Thank you. Okay? So I've got a <clears throat> multi-part question for you. Uh, first of all, um, do you think that uh, the court has a role to play in the broader community? Uh, and if so, what is that role? And then what do you think is the role that individual judges have to play in the broader community? I don't know about a role with the broader community because that makes us sort of activists, but um, my role as a judge, I think, is to make sure that the person who's in front of me feels whether or not I give them you know, six months in jail or I let them go, they at least feel like they were treated fairly. Maybe that's our role, is to make sure they walk out of there and go, you know, that he treated me fairly. And it's kind of an interesting thing, Don. The, uh, there are times when I'll be uh, dealing with somebody who's got all kinds of problems. And I'll kind of list it. And you can see the heads of the other defendants nodding in the group going, yeah, you're right, Judge. You, you know, he is. <laughs> There's something, you know, he needs to be punished. And I mean, I, you see that. So I think it's just feeling that they're, it, they're being treated fairly. I mean, you know, that's what most people want. They, you know, most people know they've done something wrong. I mean, this, other than the DV cases and the DUI cases, I mean, for the most part, these are cases where there are just people that don't function well. They get themselves in trouble by not doing what they're supposed to do. Look at this. How many suspended license cases do you deal with? All right? And how hard is it to keep your license, you know, go file the paperwork? But you have thousands of them every year because they don't do it. I call them my uh, DNF students from high school. <laughs> okay? They're the kids that didn't show up for class. They did all the other things. And so you got to work with them a little bit. Okay. Next. Phoenix has a very diverse population, as you know. Uh, what strategies would you use as a judge to ensure that every individual that appears before you feels that they were treated fairly? Or what strategies do you use now? I treat everybody the same and they can see it. Okay, they know that I will be uh, tough on people and it doesn't matter who they are or why. Um, and that's the only thing you can do. I don't, I don't know that there's anything else you can do. You just you make sure that, like I said, everybody feels like they got a fair deal. Because most of the folks know they messed up and they know they're gonna get punished. So. Thank you. <laughs> Microphone. You're making it really hard for me to hear if you turn the mic off. <laughs> what element in your background um, do you feel will be the most significant in being successful as a good judge? I've been through this before. I grew up in New Jersey. I was born in Camden, New Jersey. Anybody knows anything about Camden, New Jersey? It's the most dangerous city in the country. Okay, I spent a lot of time on the street. I never got caught doing anything, but I, a lot of the people that I was with did a lot of things that I didn't get involved in. I think it's just that I can relate to people. You know, being a defense attorney for years, I, I, I knew people and I related to them from that standpoint too. So I just, you know, that's what I think helps me. I, I don't, I talk to people, I don't ever, I try not to ever talk down to people. I try to talk to them like I'm trying to talk to you guys, um, you know, on the same level and make them feel like they can talk to me, so. Good afternoon. Go ahead. Good afternoon. I can't, I'm trying to read your name. My problem is I can't see it even with my contacts. So. My name is Carlos Rascon. Okay, thank you, Carlos. What level of importance do you place on fairness and equity as a judge? And how do you measure your success in being fair and equitable? Well, you have to be fair and equitable. You have to look at everything you have. Um, well, maybe as, a, I was trying to think of a way to say this. Was it a couple weeks ago, Don, we were in the paper? 
when Jeff got yelled at about by one of them and I was the judge and, and it turned out I went to Jeff and I said, what happened? Where did all this information come from? He said, oh, they filed a supplement after we saw him in court that had all the information that was in the case that we never saw. I mean, when I'm there, I want to know every detail I can know, and then that's how I make a, a fair decision. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. I, I, I kind of get a sense what's the right thing to do in each case. I do tend to have certain, I don't know if it's a bias, but to be quite frankly, I'll use this as an example. In domestic violence cases, if somebody punches a woman in the face, they're probably going to stay. If they punch a hole in the wall, then we'll talk about whether they go home. And I think that's fairness, okay? That's just a way of looking at it. I mean, you can't, you have so many cases that you have to develop some sense. So I think you have to be fair. I'm fair. I, I know I'm fair. I, I don't know if you noticed, but I officiated football for 35 years. I taught officials. You know, I taught all that. It's no different. Well, it is different. But you're doing, you're judging, okay, every day when you walk out on the field. And... The idea is like care. These are, this is what the rules are. This person is, are they within? Yes. Are they not? No. Okay. The second part was, how do you personally measure your success in being fair and equitable? Well, in the world I'm in, you know, you see the same people a lot, so you can't tell. Okay, because a lot of it has to do with. You know, they owe money and they don't pay and they come back and you see them again and you see them again. You start, I'm starting to look at files and I see that I've been doing signing in this file for a long time. But uh, I, I, I guess I'm arrogant. I think I'm fair all the time. I think I'm making the right decision all the time. That's the only thing you can do because what are you going to do is, is to undermine yourself and worry about it. I mean, you have to make a call. Okay, when you're doing this, you have to make a call. You're going to be right probably 95% of the time, but there's a 5% where you miss. And that's just reality. I mean, you, you, you're not perfect. Okay? And so I think I'm very fair. In fact, I think if you talk to any of my staff, they'll tell you I'm probably too fair. You know? I don't want to put people in jail if I don't have to. If you tell me there's a mandatory sentence, fine. If I can try to keep people out of jail for misdemeanors, then I will. But sometimes you can't. I mean, that's just the way the facts are. Go ahead. Inclusion, sir. <laughs> as, as you know, we've, we, we've had the pleasure today, we will have the pleasure today of, of talking to a number of highly qualified candidates, including yourself. Uh, what would you like to leave us with about what in your mind sets you apart in this appointment process? Well, the obvious one is I'm so much more experienced than anybody else in doing this. Okay, I mean, I, um, when I first was pro teming here, they put me in uh, the send out court and I was doing, for about three months, I was doing one to two jury trials a week. Um, I can do anything you need to do and if that's what you need, Okay, somebody that can hit the ground running and get, do, do this. I also don't really care, and this is going to come out wrong, and I've been trying to figure out a way to say this all the time. Okay, um, I'm prepared to do whatever they need me to do. A lot of times people who get appointed want to have a division. They want to do jury trials. If he wants me to do jury trials, I'll do jury trials. If he wants me to do... The second floor, that's where I cut my teeth. I've been doing the second floor for 15 years. Um, I don't really, I don't want to say I don't care. It's just not that, I think that I'm good at what I do. I'm here as, a, as someone that can help. And wherever they need me to do it, I don't have a problem doing it. If Don says, hey, you've got a division and then you're going to run a docket, fine. That's fine. I don't need that for myself. I just, you know. I do what I have to do. I've always been a team player, okay, and that's the main thing. I've always been on teams. I can't remember when I, uh, you know, until I got old when I wasn't on a team, but, you know, an athletic team of some sort, but, you know, that's about it. I mean, 
I know what I'm doing. I've been doing it a long time. Uh, if I've messed up, they would have fired me a long time ago. <laughs> okay, I'm, and I'm not saying I didn't. I've done everything perfect, but you know. All right. Any other questions? This group is tough. I'm I telling that's, you. I think that's all the questions. Nice to see you, have. David. Thank you for your time this afternoon. It's been good for those of us who don't know you to get to know you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So our next interview, we will be with Tina Solomon. I know we're way early for her. I think she just got here, so it may be a few minutes for her to make her way upstairs. I hope she knows that she doesn't have to rush. She can take her time. Um, well, for the next people, we are running early, so people can take their time, take a breath. So we can tell them that. And same to you, Ms. Solomon. If you want to. I know we're way early, so. That's fine, I'm ready to go, but thank you. All right, nice, probably need to push the button. Oh, it's I think on. you're good. Okay, great. I think you're good. Good afternoon, nice to see all of you. Good afternoon, nice to see you again. Um, we have a half dozen or so questions for you, okay. and we expect the interview will take about 15 minutes or so. Ready. Uh, Ms. Adele? Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Congratulations on making it to this part in the process. Our first question for you, we'd like for you to tell us about an ethical dilemma that you faced in your life, and it could be personal or professional, but also tell us about how you dealt with that ethical dilemma and it, how it changed you as a person. <clears throat> well, honestly, I can't think of an ethical dilemma that I've had off the top of my head, but in a more general response to your question, um, during the course of my 19 years as a trial attorney, things have come up with cases. And in talking with colleagues and um, other people in the office, ethical questions come up. And people come to me with, what do you think is the right thing to do? And I will tell you that what drives me personally is this gut feeling and this voice inside of me. I, of course, will consult with the state bar or look at the ethics opinions. But what really drives me is, what is the right thing to do? And I have a good instinct on that. And if I have a question about it, then like I said, I will consult the state bar, consult ethics opinions, and speak to colleagues. But I am very much driven by an, an, an instinctual um, desire to always do the right thing. And so generally, in speaking about cases, that would be my response. Good afternoon, Ms. Solomon. Good afternoon. Um, so I have a factual scenario to give you um, if you could just listen to that factual scenario um, and after you take that uh, factual scenario and if you could kind of tell me how you would deal with that issue and any issues that you see that you think are important to your determination. Okay. Um, so assume that you are a city of Phoenix judge. You're down in jail court and it's uh, one of the midnight, late night jail court type of situations and you have an individual come in before you. He is charged with a criminal offense. It's a domestic violence offense. So there's a victim involved in that. And as you start to talk to him about, and the case is called after you start to talk to him, you feel like you may have some competency issues present uh, with your interaction with him. Um, however, he is adamant that he wants to plead guilty to you there, Matt, resolve the matter both for his own interest and the victim's interest, and just move on with it. And he really wants to resolve the matter right there. Um, how would you handle that situation, or what do you think is an appropriate response? Well, my first thought would be um, appointing an attorney to this defendant. I would be um, very concerned about pushing forward and going forward with a plea when I have concerns about a person's competency. So I would not feel comfortable with that at all. 
I would make sure the person is appointed counsel, that there's a conversation um, with the defendant and, and that uh, attorney, and have the attorney um, evaluate whether they think the person is um, competent to go forward. So I would not feel comfortable as a judge proceeding forward with a change of plea, um, thinking that the person is not in a competent state of mind to go forward with that decision. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Stalin. Good afternoon. Um, as you noted, you have been practicing in the municipal court for 19 years. Uh, you're certainly familiar with it. Uh, I have a multi-part question. What do you think, or do you think, um, that the court has a role to play in the broader community? Uh, if so, what do you think that role is? And then what do you think the role of individual judges in the broader community is? Yes to both. <clears throat> I absolutely believe that the court has a role in the community. And I think it's the judge's responsibility um, individually and as a whole to promote confidence in the judiciary. And you do that by interacting with the community. I think you gain perspective on the rulings that you make on a daily basis and how those rulings affect individuals as well as the community by being in the community. And so unless you're involved in the community, you don't have that perspective. I fortunately have been involved in Kitchen on the Street, an organization, a nonprofit organization to eliminate hunger. I've also been involved with a community garden that grows food for DV shelters. I've been involved as a donor for the Phoenix Children's Hospital. Those perspectives give me a better sense of um, the rulings or the decisions I make in court. So I think absolutely the court and individual judges have that responsibility <coughs> to promote that confidence in the judiciary and be involved in the community. I think that's the best way to have a perspective on how the rulings and the decisions they make affect other people. Uh, Phoenix has a div very diverse population. What <clears throat> strategies would you use as a judge to ensure that every individual that appears before you feels that they were treated fairly? I, diversity is very important. I feel like I come from a diverse background as well, and um, mostly because of my socioeconomic background, but also by experience. And I mean, diversity is celebrating the differences in people. And I think because of my background, I'm able to relate to people. And it's not just that I have this diversity in my background, but it's how I use that diversity to see and treat and respect other people. And if I can give you an example, I'm currently involved and um, proud to be part of the creation of the suspended license court. And all types of people come into the suspended license court, people who are unemployed, people who have had addiction troubles, people who are homeless. And I treat every single person with respect and dignity and I look them straight in the eye and I have dialogue with that person. I use them um, whether it's uh, by the last name but sometimes by the first name when I have them regularly in my courtroom. And I have that type of human experience with them. And I think that that's how I would approach things as a, as a judge as well. Because Phoenix is a diverse population and we celebrate those differences in the diversity. I think often though there are more commonalities and there are differences with all of all the people. And so I think treating people with dignity and respect so that they feel like they have the opportunity to be heard. And, 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 and make no mistake, people aren't always happy when they walk out of the courtroom. <laughs> Oftentimes they're not. But I think it matters more to them than the outcome, the fact that they felt like they could be heard and they were heard with respect and dignity. And that's very important to me in how I deal with people on a daily basis, and that's exactly how I would deal with people as a judge. Welcome back. Thank you, how are you? <laughs> you probably know the question I'm gonna ask. I do. What is the answer? Well, I told you um, human element, and I'm gonna expand on it. But the single most quality of a judge, I believe, is the ability to... Um, I don't mean to break in, but boy. <laughs> Craig, you're getting predictable. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's your third time here. Fourth? No, actually, I, today is my sixth time. Oh my God. But it's my third time, I believe, with you. I appreciate the question, and it's an important question, because I think, um, and as I told you before, and I'll repeat that again, but I'll expand on it. It's the ability to connect with people. <coughs> you could be the smartest person in the room, you could know every law in the book, but if you are not able in the City of Phoenix Municipal Court to sit on the bench and connect with people, then you're at a disadvantage. This is a misdemeanor courthouse, 
And oftentimes, the people that are in this courthouse, it's the first time they're having any, any interaction at all with the judicial system. And they want to feel, again, they want to feel like they're being heard and respected. And, and that comes from the judge. And that's the ability to connect with people. And going back to the example of suspended license court, I walk in and people recognize me. And I can tell you so many people are so excited to shake that driver's license in my face and say, oh my gosh, I got reinstated. And I think it's, it's, it's the relationship that I've developed with many of the defendants. And I say relationship, but they know that I'm rooting for them, that I want them to get reinstated, that I'm trying to provide them information so that they can get reinstated. And so that's the goal of the entire court, is for people to understand what they need to do and to get reinstated. And so it's not so much adversarial, but I'm not, I'm not doing anything for them but I'm helping them succeed and be successful. And I think that connection and that encouragement and that um, dialogue with them is so critical because they have a smile on their face and they realize I want them to be successful. And so they're very motivated to come in time and time again and say, this is what I've gotten done. You know, this is my checklist. I've gotten three, you know, three checks marked off and I'm working on it. I think I have that ability to connect with people. I think I have the ability to inspire and motivate. And it's not to say I don't have the ability to be firm when I need to be. I can. I can definitely be firm. But I think without that connection, it's very difficult for people to succeed, especially in this misdemeanor court. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What level of importance would you place on fairness and equity as a judge? And how would you measure your success in being fair and equitable? Well, I believe um, it's of utmost importance. Um, the Code of Digital, Digital Conduct, Conduct, of course, talks about um, independence and, and impartiality and integrity. But again, people need to believe in the judiciary. They need to have confidence in the judiciary. And they need to believe that they're getting a fair shake. It might not be what they want. But they need to know that when I come into the courtroom, Ms. Solomon, who's on the bench, is going to listen to what I have to say. And she's going to consider what I'm saying. And she's going to weigh what I'm saying. And I'm going to do that for each and every person that comes before me. So I think it's, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, if a person doesn't feel like they were fairly treated, it doesn't just impact that person. It impacts other people in the community. And so people lose faith whether it's the defendant, whether it's the victim. And you don't want that to happen with um, the judiciary, and especially with the city of Phoenix Municipal Court and so many people that are coming in for the first time. You need to make sure that you are being fair and equitable at all times. And how would you measure your success in being fair and equitable? Uh, and thank you for um, reminding me of that second part. I think my success has been um, and I will say outstanding, and let me tell you why. <clears throat> One of the concerns I think that has been brought to my attention is that you've been a prosecutor for 19 years, just a prosecutor, not a defense attorney, so how, how can we know that you're fair and equitable? I will tell you that um, I have always carried myself as fair and equitable, and when it would have been easier to say the answer is no, I've always chosen to say let me look at it, let me consider it. Let me hear what your person, what your client has to say or what you have to say. And as a result, I can tell you that I have defense attorneys after defense attorneys calling me and saying, can you please look at this, Tina? Can you please consider this? This is what my client has to say. Can you look at that? And sometimes I'm, I, I, I agree. Sometimes I do not. But they know that I'm going to look at it fairly equitably and give it consideration and not just brush it off. So I think my reputation precedes me in that it's not just my colleagues in the prosecutor's office, but it's fellow defense attorneys that have seen how fair and equitable I can be. And so I have no doubt that I would carry that over to the bench. In conclusion. Yeah. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you this afternoon. As you know, we are interviewing a number of highly qualified candidates, including yourself today. What would you like to leave us with in terms of uh, what you believe sets you apart in this appointment process? Thank you. 
I first of all want to thank all of you for the opportunity to interview. And as several of you know, I have appeared before you. And so I hope that you have a better idea or a glimpse of who I am as a person and who I will be as a judge. There, the bottom line is, is I want to be a City of Phoenix Municipal Court judge. And I have spent years preparing myself for this position. And I truly believe that this is where I can impact people's lives and the community by being in this position. It's not just about making a difference. It's about restoring people, giving people faith, and, and, and working with people, of course, within the boundaries of the law. I am 49 years old. I said, like I said, bring 19 years of experience to the bench. And this is a trial court. I recognize that. I've done over 100 jury trials. I've done hundreds of bench trials. So as a judge, I would understand what's happening on the other side of the bench. I also am familiar with court operations and case processing. When we started suspended license court in November of 2017, we thought a manageable docket was about 35 cases. We have since refined it and streamlined it, and I can tell you we are now doing dockets between 90 and 110 cases. And there is not a single person in that room that I don't speak to, that I don't have eye contact with, and that I work with and um, have dialogue. Is that and a day? It's on Tuesdays at and Fridays at afternoon. A 100 at a, on a day? Yes, on a docket. Now, not all of them show up, so I mean in all candor, but still, that's the docket size. And we handle that docket within about a two, two and a half hour time frame. So I have no doubt I can hit the ground running. I can manage heavy dockets. I can manage caseloads. In fact, this morning I had someone from court call me, or uh, email me rather, and ask me to be part of a meeting because apparently a week or so ago there was a delay in the defendant seeing the judge. And so um, this administrator wants me to be included in the meeting to try to refine the process and make it better. And I consider myself a problem solver. I want to be part of that process. I want to make the city of Phoenix court better. I'm also familiar with the specialty courts, veterans court, behavioral health court. I've been involved in regional homeless court. And as I said, I'm very proud to be involved in suspended license court. I feel like I understand the vision. I understand the goals of the court. And I'm excited to be part of that. But most importantly, and, and this is back to Mr. Stebley's question, most importantly, I feel like I understand the people the people that come through this courthouse, like I said, often for the first time. And they are people who are homeless, people who are unemployed, people who are addicted, people who have had death or tragedy in their life. And I can relate and understand them from the diversity and the background that I have. And so I believe I have the temperament to be a judge. I believe that I respect every person I come in contact with, and I also believe that I have built a reputation of being fair and reasonable as an attorney, and I am 100% confident that I would carry that over to the bench to be a fair and reasonable judge. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the conversation. We've enjoyed seeing you, and have a good afternoon. Thank you. You also. All right, I'm informed. I think that we do not have anyone handy to move ahead on the interview schedule, so we'll take, stand and stretch a bit. We have three more to go this afternoon. <laughs>